All right, uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Will Porter. I'm a postdoc at MIT, uh, working with Colette Heald, uh, along with a few other collaborators, on an examination of uh, air quality extremes, so high levels, uh, events with particularly high levels of ozone, uh, fine particulate fine particulate matter, and examining what kinds of sensitivities these extreme events have in terms of their meteorological drivers. Uh, in recent years, we've seen a number of high profile uh, air quality events, uh, Russia and China, the uh, United States and elsewhere, and there's been a strong interest in understanding what kinds of, uh, what kinds of meteorological drivers uh, might be most responsible for generating these kinds of events. And so we've, uh, we've looked at this, uh, and one of, the, one of the assumptions that we've kind of tried to move away from is the notion that all aspects of these responses, all aspects of these uh, ozone and, and, and PM2.5 responses are driven in a similar way by the different meteorological variables. For example, if we look at a typical polluted regime here, we often see a heavy tail in, in terms of these highest levels. And uh, with a standard at around 75, at 75 ppb in the United States, oftentimes we're interested in what's happening uh, way over here on the far right of this tail. But it's important to remember that the, the events that might drive, say, a 75 ppb day into a 100 are not necessarily the same as those that would drive 25 to 50 in terms of the meteorology underlying these kinds of events. And so we've looked at this from, uh, from a question saying, what kinds of meteorological sensitivities are affecting these heavy tails? How do they compare to the kinds of meteorological sensitivities that we see over the rest of the ozone and PM2.5 distribution? And furthermore, if we look at these sensitivities and we compare them within uh, observations, how do they then compare to the kinds of sensitivities that we see uh, when we model these same kinds of events? Um, and so in order to make this happen, we used a technique called quantile regression. And just to run you through really quickly what this looks like, um, I'm going to compare it to a very familiar form of regression, just ordinary least squares. If you take uh, a max daily temperature on our x-axis here, uh, the daily max eight-hour ozone average uh, on the y-axis, we can do a fit, and it, it's, it's reasonable. We do see some nonlinearity, and we see that actually the fit seems to get worse as we get to higher levels uh, of temperature. In fact, we see the variability of ozone uh, looking up and down actually increases. And the variability changing as a function of our indicator variable produces what's known as a heteroscedastic data set. And this is one where just doing an ordinary least squares uh, may not be sufficient to adequately describe what's going on in terms of sensitivities. If we modify this regression slightly, we can produce what's known as the conditional median. This is the 50th percentile quantile regression. And then by modifying that regression, furthermore, we can then target individual percentiles of our distribution and say, look at the 95th, uh, the 5th, and we can see how temperature affects not just the mean of our distribution, not just the, the median, but all different percentiles. Uh, and we can see that we actually can represent fairly well uh, what's going on for different ozone percentiles of interest. Now, we, of course, are mostly interested in what's going on at that 95th percentile, um, but we can look at how those slopes how the slopes of the lowest, the median, the 95th, and everything in between are affected um, by temperature, and then plot those slopes themselves as a function of our percentile of interest. And this shows here, we can see that as we go from low ozone percentiles up to the higher ozone percentiles, we see steadily increasing slopes, indicating higher and higher sensitivities as we look at the higher and higher ozone levels. This indicates that as temperature warms, we're going to see a, a sharper increase in our ozone ceilings the worst case scenarios than, than we would see an increase in our floors, so the, the average or the low ozone days. And this is the kind of difference in sensitivities that we're interested in, in examining. So in order to make this happen, we, we took a few different uh, inputs here. Uh, we looked at observations using EPA's AQS network for ozone, uh, and then we, we combined those with a, a host of meteorological uh, variables available through uh, reanalysis meteorology, uh, which provided us the widest range uh, of, of different variables to compare those to. Um, and then in order for comparison's sake, we then applied, we compared those results to what we got using uh, CESM output. So we looked at the kinds of sensitivities that we saw doing quantile regressions using the observations plus reanalysis. We compared that to pure model, and we wanted to see what kinds of differences, similarities we might see. So a few issues, of course, we had to tackle early on here, namely um, 
First of all, we have tons of meteorological variables available through this reanalysis product. We know that a number of them are viable candidates for looking at uh, indicators for these kinds of events. Uh, but we also know that for any given variable, there's a number of temporal choices as well. Do you take daily maxima? Do you take minima? Do you take means? Do you take some combination of multiple day means? And so there's all kinds of ways to put these together. And also a number of these meteorological and temporal combinations are highly collinear. So for example, we know that temperature has very clear collinearity with relative humidity. They're associated, they're connected. And so if we include too many of these collinear variables in regressions, in any kind of regression, it's going to become unstable and, and nasty. So we wanted to avoid that as well. So we started with as large a suite of possible indicators as we could. We then did a filter uh, to remove those that had individually high correlations that could be predicted by the other covariates. Uh, and then we did a ranking and selection routine to figure out which ones were most important, not just overall nationally, but that stood out uh, regionally as well. We wanted to, to try and capture whatever was going on on both a, a, a widespread and on a regional basis. And then we applied those to multivariate quantile regression. I showed you quantile regressions that were performed with one variable, temperature and ozone. They can be done multivariate just like with an ordinary least squares. Uh, and and you, get the, you can see individual uh, responses based on those coefficients. So when we put all this through, what types of top indicators did we find? If we look at it nationally, this is a, a map showing the top driver. So if we normalize by the standard deviations of our individual covariates, uh, we can kind of get an estimate of what's the, the most significant driver at all these stations. We see a lot of red, which indicates temperature. And we're looking at 95th percentile quantile regression slopes here. Uh, so temperature stands out. Uh, we also see wind direction, relative humidity, uh, cloud cover, uh, lower tropospheric stability, uh, shortwave radiation flux, uh, turbulence. Uh, rain, and then a host of other variables as well stood out as the number one drivers in different stations. There's a lot of red on that figure. And indeed, if we tally up all of those top driver uh, stations, we see that temperature stands out, uh, which is not terribly surprising. We recognize temperature as an important driver uh, for all different aspects of that ozone response. If we go in a little bit deeper with that temperature, though, let's take a look at how that temperature coefficient, how those temperature sensitivities differ when we look at different quantiles of that ozone response. If we just look at median slopes, so this was that black line in my little ozone versus temperature split. If we take those at all different stations, we see a few things. We see it's largely positive. So temperatures tend to increase our conditional median. Uh, and then we also see when we compare that to our fifth and 95th, we see an interesting split whereby the 95th percentile, it's shown in kind of a pinkish peach on this screen, um, are higher on average than our medians, and which are themselves higher than our fifth percentile slopes. So we see an increasing sensitivity, much like the figure I showed early on, so that the 95th percentiles of these ozone responses uh, tend to be higher than the medians, which are themselves higher than the fifth. We see a steadily increasing uh, sensitivity as we look at higher and higher um, ozone responses. What happens if we compare this to our model output? If we look just in CESM and we use some bilinear interpolation to match up our station locations as best we can, we see that reversed. We see that, in fact, the 95th percentile slopes are the lowest when we compare those to the medians and the fifth. They're still positive. They're still all positively responding to temperature. We're still getting more ozone with more temperatures, but our distribution is shifted differently. We're seeing that heteroscedasticity apply in a different fashion. And so this has some interesting implications in terms of what kinds of ozone responses we can, we can expect. If we look at, so one question that I, I actually asked when I looked at this was I was wondering how dependent is this on the inclusion of other covariates? Is this something uh, uh, in, involving interactions with other, with other terms, with the wind speeds or with, uh, um, with relative humidities? And so even though if we take out the other covariates, if we just do a monovariate regression, we see the same thing. And we see still uh, a positive slope moving up into higher quantiles of ozone. We see steeper and steeper responses in that ozone distribution. And then CSM, we still see the negative trends with weaker slopes as we move up to higher, um, higher uh, percentiles of that ozone response. What if we go to a finer resolution? Rerunning this with one degree horizontal resolution CESM, what do we see? Not much change. So this does not seem to appear to be, at least in terms of the two degree to the one degree change, does not appear to be highly sensitive uh, to, to improving the resolution of our model.
we still see that kind of inverted sensitivity. I won't call it a temperature inversion, but I'll call it a sensitivity inversion. Um, what about, though, if we drive this not with free-running dynamics, so if we don't allow CESM to choose its own, um, its own uh, transport, but we impose an external uh, product, say CESM, uh, or I'm sorry, say uh, Geos 5, uh, onto our... Um, onto our runs, we see a very different picture. All of a sudden, with the external, with the specified dynamics by Geos 5, we now see much higher sensitivities overall. Um, and we see now the extremes, the highest extremes and the lowest extremes are fairly close, and we see a big bulge in the middle, so that the 25th to 50th percentiles have higher sensitivities than those that we observe. What kinds of consequences would this difference, would these differences of sensitivities have if we were to, say, apply just some sort of increase in, in max daily temperature? If we go back to our um, many stations that we started off with from the AQS network, and we take a look at, say, example, the kind of distribution that we'd see in, in ozone levels at any given station, we could apply, just say, a, a two degree increase in temperature, in max daily temperature, and take a look at what our sensitivities would tell us would happen to that particular distribution for each station. Now, of course, each of our different runs are observed and reanalysis two degree CSM, one degree specified dynamics, imply different sensitivities to different aspects of our distribution. And so if we compare the modeled sensitivities to the observed, we get differences in what kind, how that particular distribution will evolve. If we take the modeled sensitivities and convert them to our observed sensitivities with that arbitrarily chosen two degree increase, we see some very different responses in mean ozone levels so for the two degree and the one degree, if we convert that to the observed sensitivities, we see increases in mean ozone overall um, for, each, for all of our stations put together. The specified dynamics, you remember, had the, higher sensitivity, the highest sensitivity of all, and we see a decrease there. If we then look at what kinds of numbers that has for exceedances, though, uh, you can see the nonlinear nature of how this, this, this operates. Our two degree and one degree end up with very comparable increases of almost six exceedances annually when we go to the observed sensitivities as opposed to the modeled. Uh, whereas the two degree uh, with specified dynamics has a small decrease. Uh, it's much smaller proportionally than the mean ozone because as you'll recall, at the highest extremes it actually ends up being fairly close to the observed sensitivities. So this kind of highlights uh, not only um, the kinds of magnitudes that, that we're talking about here when we look at changes in temperature, changes in ozone, uh, how ozone would be affected by climate change, uh, but also the nonlinear nature of how looking at the entire distribution, the entire sensitivity distribution, uh, may be important when we're talking about model verification, when we're talking about projections. So, uh, in summary, we have here uh, a variety of different sensitivities when we look at observations and reanalysis, when we look at modeled sensitivities. Uh, these kinds of sensitivities can have implications on, on projected means of ozone, as well as projected exceedances. Um, and moving forward, some of the things we'd like to explore, um, we'd like to look globally. We've been looking entirely at the United States. Uh, we know that United States emissions are expected to come down in future years. Uh, we also know that many of the kinds of interesting uh, events that we're seeing worldwide are happening outside the United States, and I think it'd be interesting to take a look at what kinds of sensitivities we see uh, in other regions of the world. Uh, we'd also like to move on to other models. Now, I, I received some data or some output from, from NASA's GIS model, and we see a very interesting result here. Overall sensitivities are much lower, but we do see an increase in sensitivity as we move up to higher percentiles, similar uh, to the, the observed there. Now, this is a much lower resolution. This is five degrees horizontally. Uh, so so it'd be interesting to know how much of that has to do with simply a smearing out of, of all those fields, how much of it might be re due to differing emissions, uh, differing chemistry. These are all questions that we hope to address. Uh, looking at PM 2.5, uh, we've looked at this a little bit, and I think that the story is, is quite interesting. We'll be moving on to that as well. Uh, and then finally, how this might affect future projections in terms of verification uh, and potentially uh, improvement. And I'd like to thank you very much and uh, take any questions. Okay, any questions? Okay, Hanat, and then Russ. Thank you, that's a 
very interesting talk. A lot of ozone has to do with chemistry, and you haven't said a word about that. So my question is, is, is the composition changes, do you expect these temperature relationships to hold? And if so, why? Do you mean in, as the, say, the, the underlying emissions in each different region? Correct, because yes. even, even in your lower percentiles versus higher percentiles, the compositions could be very different. Absolutely, yeah. And, and each, each station, we assume, has an underlying emissions regime that will set up all of these sensitivities. All these sensitivities, I think, are hinge on those underlying uh, emissions, the underlying chemistry. Um, as those change, absolutely, the sensitivities will evolve. We, in, in our modern day analysis, we included time as a kind of a covariate to, a, to a kind of take into account how emissions may have changed uh, over time. So that was, in a manner of speaking, corrected for. But it's true that we can only look forward so far, uh, assuming changes in the underlying emissions in chemistry. Uh, nice talk. Uh, you had an actual negative sensitivity when you ran a five by five model. Was that global or just uh, over the land? And oh, in answer to the to Hungwatt's problem, I say uh, be here tomorrow morning, and we'll, I'll tell you how it responds to changes in NOx emissions. Um, those were all pinned to uh, the stations in, included in that original study. So those were uh, simply taking a bilinear interpolation uh, of the GIS grid cells. So in effect, it was over land. Um, yeah. 